Hello and welcome to Baiju's IAS. It, is, it has been our endeavor at Baiju's to help and support IAS aspirants at every stage of their preparation. Now, when IAS mains examination 2021 is over and aspirants are gearing up for the last leg of this prestigious examination, that is personality test, we are back again to assist them forming an insight and opinion about multiple topics and issues concerning our great nation and its body polity. Like last year, we have meticulously curated a special series of talks and lectures to help our would-be steel pillars of this nation for their personality test. In this special series of talk, we invite the stalwarts of our nation, renowned personalities, eminent civil servants, academicians and intellectuals to address the young aspirants of UPSC civil services examination and guide them by sharing their views on contemporary topics, on important topics. In this special series of talk, we invite the stalwarts of our nation, renowned personalities, eminent civil servants, academicians, and intellectuals to address the young aspirants of UPSC civil services examination and guide them on multiple topics, on contemporary topics, chosen carefully from various spheres of knowledge, such as Indian economy, our judicial system, India's foreign policy, issues related to internal security, ecology and environment, etc. When we started this series last year, we received overwhelming response from students in general and from those preparing for their personality test in particular. Needless to say, this series will help you to get ready and give finishing touches for the final stage of this examination, that is personality test, and provide you with pragmatic insights to maximize your score. Today, in this series of talk, we are joined by a very distinguished columnist, editor, and leading expert, nuclear and international security issues, Commodore Uday Bhaskar, sir. Thank you. Sir is a retired military officer who served in the Indian Navy. Sir is currently the director of the Society for Policy Studies, an independent think tank based in Delhi. Sir is also a life member of the United Service Institution of India. Welcome to Baiju's IES, sir. Thank you. We are really honored and privileged to have you in our series. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Sir. The first question relates to this ongoing crisis in Ukraine versus Russia. Almost all major powers, including United Nations, they have uh, requested for ceasefire and they have actually uh, called this unilateral invasion a violation of international treaty. But Russia is not stopping. What do you think? What is the relevance of United Nations or can we say United Nations has gone irrelevant? In this particular crisis, you know, where Russia has unilaterally invaded Ukraine, we can see that the United Nations has not been particularly effective. And this is not new because Russia is a permanent member of the UNSC, the Security Council. And as in the past, whenever the security interests of a permanent member are being either pursued or deliberated, the UNSC generally does not find any consensus. As I said, if you recall, in the past 60 years or 70 years from 1945 to where we are now is almost 75 years, whether it was the United States or the former Soviet Union during the Cold War, and now United States and Russia after the end of the Cold War, if there has been any major difference of opinion or divergent views, the UNSC 
does not find consensus and we are aware that if the UNSC has to take any effective steps, there must be consensus within the five members or among the five members who are permanent. As we can see in this case, Russia decided unilaterally to invade Ukraine because they perceived whatever aspirations that Ukraine had vis-a-vis -vis the European Union or NATO were considered to be a security threat to Russia. So this is a rather, to my mind, weak kind of argument or formulation and it is an act to be deplored. And unfortunately, the UNSC as a body, that is the Security Council, and the United Nations in its larger framework of all the 193 members has not been able to really prevent or prevail upon Moscow. And that, to my mind, is a reflection of the nature of real politics and the fact that Russia has decided to use its military capability. And more importantly, I thought they also made a reference to their nuclear capability, which is very alarming. So I think this is the reality of where we are, that when a major power decides to act in this manner, the Security Council is not effective. There is uh, one question related to this only. Uh, what is the way out? Because if uh, all major powers or five mem permanent members, they start violating United Nations, so in, uh, then uh, can we see a chaotic uh, world, world order or what is the way out? No, I'm afraid this is the you know reality of the current global system that there is an increasing what I would call as flouting of international norms, laws and the kind of sanctity that had been accorded to agreements and treaties. Now this is particularly relevant when it comes to Ukraine because again I think we need to remember that when the Cold War ended, after all Ukraine was a former republic of the Soviet Union. The former Soviet Union comprised of a number of republics and Ukraine was the most important republic in terms of size, population and its own what I would call as socio-economic indicators. So when the Soviet Union imploded in December 1991, there were three republics that had nuclear weapons apart from Russia, which is now a federation. These three republics, former republics, which later became independent countries were Ukraine, Belarus and Kazakhstan. Now at that time, all three of them were persuaded, they were prevailed upon, which is a mix of carrot and I would say, muscle arm twisting, to give up their nuclear weapons. But the guarantee given to them was that if you renounce your nuclear weapons and become what is called as a non-nuclear weapon state, then three of the major powers at that time, that is United States, Russia and UK, guaranteed their territorial integrity and their security and sovereignty. So this was actually detailed in something called the Budapest Memorandum of 1994. Mm -hmm. So today what we are seeing is that Ukraine, despite the fact that it was given these guarantees by these three countries, US, Russia and UK, and it was the same foreign minister of Russia, Mr. Lavrov, who had then signed that particular agreement as the permanent representative of Russia at that time in the UN. So you can see that a very important agreement has been flouted. There is no sanctity. So now the question that is going to come up in everyone's mind in the smaller countries or say those who are watching this is that if Ukraine had nuclear weapons, Moscow may not have acted in this manner. So what is the message it is giving to the global non-proliferation movement or I would say that particular uh, goal is now going to become very muddied. So that's a very serious kind of implication. Now I want to extend this point and also make this sort of observation that as this war has unfolded, we saw a situation where a Russian projectile had attacked or it was launched on the nuclear power station. That in turn led to a fire. Now, of course, it's a different matter that what was actually attacked was only a training facility and not the reactor. But the fear of a nuclear radiation, you know, the foreign minister of Ukraine has said this could have been 10 times worse than what happened in Chernobyl. So this is a another international, I would say, crisis that the nuclear capability, whether it is civilian nuclear or nuclear weapon, brings in a very disturbing dimension. So again, we are back to the 
challenge that how does the global system deal with a major power that acts in a manner that could be almost described as rogue. Now this is a very strong word to use in relation to Russia because we in India have a very warm relationship with the former Soviet Union and today's Russia. But I personally feel that Russia's actions in this case are almost indefensible. Now there is a lot of you know talk about the fact that Russia was cheated and they were promised that NATO would not expand. Now as I said that is part of the history. You know one does not deny it. But then the question that often comes is that can any country whether it is a Ukraine today or tomorrow it can be Estonia be constantly held to the template of the Cold War and say that what happened in the Cold War cannot be changed and because Ukraine or an Estonia or any of the Stans were part of the former Soviet Union they will continue to defer to Moscow. I think that becomes difficult you know with the passage of time. So that is the reason why I find it as I said I am not in agreement with much of the views that have been expressed in our own country about Russia's actions. Great. Thank you sir. Sir, NATO expansion to the east towards Russia, it is said to be one of the reasons for the war. Russia uh, NATO is uh, planning to or Ukraine had applied for the membership and it is seen as violation of agreements made after Cold War. And there have been similar breaches of agreements by almost all global powers in different arenas. Correct. Modern day agreements are seen as mere tools for the global powers to be used against each other while being free to violate it themselves. Now, should India's alliance pursued in the Indo-Pacific security matters consider this conundrum? I think we should. You know, India is aware of the fact that if you look at it historically, the world has been divided into what is often referred to as the haves and the have-nots, the more powerful and the less powerful. You know, we use a terminology about the developed world. We talk about the G7. At one time, one of the phrases that used to be used was third world. Mm -hmm. It's not being used so much these days. But there is a reality that in the last, I would say, 25 years almost, ever since the end of the Cold War, when we had Mr. Narasim Rao as our Prime Minister and India embarked on liberalization and that whole phase, in the last 30 years literally from 91 to where we are now in 2022, the global orientation has been one where the rich have got richer and the poor have got poorer. And this I would say is one of those stark realities of globalization which is really unfortunate. Now among countries, within countries, you can see that this particular divide, globalization has not been fair. That is one observation. Within that in terms of geopolitics, we can see that the powerful countries have in a way introduced agreements and treaties that are in their favor. I'll give you two examples. One, my own area of work is say the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, what is called as the NPT. Ever since the NPT was introduced into the global framework, it has no legal basis by the way, it was just imposed. You could see that India was one of the countries that was targeted till such time as we carried out the nuclear tests of May 1998 when Mr. Vajpayee was Prime Minister. But the NPT is a good example in terms of geopolitics and security strategic domain where a treaty was imposed which actually favors those five countries that were seen as the P5N5. The permanent members of the Security Council are also deemed to be the five countries that are allowed to retain their nuclear weapons. The rest of the world has been told that you have to renounce. India is the only country that has been given this exceptional status. In the trade and economic arena, you find that the WTO, the World Trade Organization as it we knew it, was also drafted in such a way, mm -hmm. the provisions, that they favored the richer countries. Mm -hmm. The poorer countries, the developing countries were in a way being, I would say, exploited. Mm -hmm. But that is the reality. So I think India is aware of all of this and also knows that the only way to deal with this is to acquire your own comprehensive national power. So in that sense, liberalization, what Mr. Narasimha Rao did, put India on a path where slowly our economic mm -hmm. capabilities were being enhanced. 
when Mr. Vajpayee carried out the nuclear test, it was a case of saying that our strategic capabilities were also gradually being enhanced. And therefore, I think today when Prime Minister Modi talks about Atma Nirbharta, self-reliance, it is also in the same direction. But I think the reality is that India has many challenges. So we have to navigate the system in such a way that our interests are protected. And that in a way, again, coming back to Ukraine, would perhaps explain why India has been ambivalent or India has been hesitant and we have abstained. Now, there's a lot of criticism in certain quarters of the world that the world's largest democracy has abstained. But as an analyst, I have taken the position that it was prudent on India's part to have abstained in this vote for the same reason that India's national interests are better served, both in the short term and my sense is in the long term, if we are able to retain some kind of linkage with Moscow, even as we try to improve our relationship with Washington. Sir, if I just extrapolate your argument that India abstained, now the point is what India did was for its, nat its national interest. Now, it is said that it was a kind of revival of taking non-aligned stance, neither for Russia or nor for West or America. But at the same time, sir, we are seeing Moscow is uh, outreaching or is making inroads towards Pakistan and uh, it's, it's, uh, Russia is also strengthening its relation with China. So how India can uh, position itself? Because Moscow earlier had a very uh, strong relationship with India. But of late, we have seen that uh, Pakistan is also approaching or uh, Moscow is also reciprocating the same. And it has a very good relationship with China. And we have border dispute which, between India and China. So how to position India's stance there? See, first of all, I think we need to remember that when we talk about geopolitics, you know, and how countries are orienting themselves or what decisions they take, it's quite cynical, meaning that what is constantly driving the political leadership of any country or the strategic, I would say, uh, advisors is what they perceive to be the abiding national interest. Mm -hmm. Now, in that, there is a lot of what I would call as permutations, combinations, and sometimes there is also the sh question of partners, you know, shifting their alliances. A very good example is that during the Cold War, if you remember, the whole Cold War was predicated on the US-led West mm -hmm. versus the former Soviet Union, which was right. deemed to be communism, authoritarian, and the divide was ostensibly, the bipolarity was freedom and democracy on one side and communism and authoritarianism on the other side. Right. So we had the Warsaw Pact. In the first phase of the Cold War, you find that the United States and the Western democracies are on one side and former USSR and China Mm -hmm. are on the other side as two large communist countries. But by the time you come to the second phase of the Cold War, when you have Nixon, Kissinger and the American outreach towards China, mm -hmm. the permutation changes. You find that the United States has co-opted China. Mm -hmm. So very often when you talk to you know senior Moscow academics and people from Russia who remember that part of history, they see China as a country that betrayed them and went into the Western camp. Mm -hmm. So the Cold War ends with the United States and China on one side. And India, if you remember, enters into what is called as a friendship treaty with Moscow mm -hmm. when Mrs. Indira Gandhi was the Prime Minister. And that also enables India to lead to the birth of Bangladesh and the famous 1971 military victory that India was able to accomplish was enabled in no small measure by our friendship treaty with Moscow. So here is the anomaly that when bipolarity is between freedom democracy on one side and communism and authoritarianism on the other side, the United States partners with a major communist country, China. Mm -hmm. And the former Soviet Union enters into a friendship treaty with the world's largest democracy. Mm -hmm. So that is the anomaly. So today when we are in the post-Cold War, what we are seeing now is the emergence of what I would call as a strategic relationship between Russia and China on one hand, who both perceive the United States to be the hegemon that they have to resist. Mm -hmm. Now, India has also improved its relationship with the United States after the civilian nuclear agreement mm -hmm. of 2008. 
And here I think we must acknowledge the role played by Dr. Manmohan Singh as Prime Minister of India and Mr. George Bush as the US President then, that they were able to in a way overcome the estrangement of more than 30 years because for from the time 1974 when India carried out the peaceful nuclear explosion till 2005 when you see the first agreement between India and the United States, what is called as the Civilian Nuclear Agreement. For 31 years, the relationship between India and the United States was tense. It was bitter. It was estranged. I mean, I have sat in meetings as a note taker, you know, where I used to be in the Institute for Defense Studies and Analysis, where we have seen great, I would say, divisions, very tense, very bitter between India and the US on security issues, particularly on the nuclear issue. And if you remember, that was the time when the United States had a very close relationship, not only with China, but also Pakistan. And they were supporting Pakistan against India very often. I mean, we remember the David Headley case, you know, those who recall the Mumbai terror attack of 2008. Despite that, this is my point, that India still maintained a fairly, I would say, practical, pragmatic relationship with the United States. Mm -hmm. And we also started importing arms from them, mm -hmm. almost 15 to 20 billion over the last decade and so on. So this is one of the characteristics of global politics and how countries take decisions. So today, when we are looking at the changing dynamic, I think India should have enough space to engage with Washington. Mm -hmm. We also have to engage with Moscow because the reality is that almost 60 to 65 percent of our military inventory supplies come from Russia, right. what we call as the former Soviet Union. And furthermore, if you look at India's strategic capabilities, mm -hmm. they have also been enabled by Russia. I mean, for instance, India, the Indian Navy has a nuclear propelled submarine, mm -hmm. the Arihant. Mm -hmm. It's actually an SSBN, yes. but the nuclear propulsion part was to a large extent enabled by Moscow because during the Cold War in 1988, they gave us the first nuclear propelled submarine INS Chakra so that India could become proficient in nuclear propulsion underwater. Mm -hmm. So these are some of the realities that Moscow has provided valuable support to India in a large number of what I would call as strategic and defense related capabilities and therefore we should not be hasty. But on this Ukraine, I just want to make an additional point, if I may, which is that I think personally that India may have abstained in the UN, in the Security Council. We also, in the UNGA, we abstained. I think if India had issued a statement deploring the Russian action and saying that this is our view, but for reasons of history, pedigree, genealogy, a relationship that enjoy with, India has traditionally with Moscow and so on and so forth, that we will not vote against Russia. Because note this nuance, which I often feel is missed out in the Indian debate. India has not recognized the two breakaway republics. If you remember the, so the Russian invasion that started on February 24th was preceded by President Putin recognizing these two breakaway republics mm -hmm. in the Donbas region. Mm -hmm. Even now, India has not recognized. Neither has China, by the way. Mm -hmm. We have also been, shall we say, very reticent about the annexation of Crimea in 2014. So I think the suggestion that India is supporting Russia is not correct. Mm -hmm. It's not borne out by the facts. But as I said, my personal preference would have been if India had issued a statement deploring what has happened because that is a matter of principle. You know, if on one hand you are constantly saying that there must be sanctity of international law and customary practice and in relation to China, whether it is South China Sea or Galwan, we said that we cannot have a situation where a major power uses its military capability in this manner. Mm -hmm. Now, if you say that in relation to South China Sea, you should have the conviction to say this even now. But this is my personal view. But we agree that governments take decisions sometimes, you know, they may be dealing with more inputs than we in the public right. domain are aware of. So. Sir, now coming to India's internal security scenario, what are the emerging national security issues and threats due to this Russian-Ukrainian crisis? Well, I would say in terms of internal security, much of it would be related to capability, meaning that, as I said, our military inventory, the supplies are largely dependent on 
Moscow. Okay. I mean, even something like the personal weapon, if you recall, we were signing a major agreement with Russia for the Kalashnikov equivalent to be manufactured in India. So that in turn would have a bearing, as I see it, on India's entire armed forces and the paramilitary forces because they need a personal weapon. Mm -hmm. So this is just one example. But more than military inventory, I think if there is a changing equation between Russia and Pakistan, whereby Pakistan becomes a recipient. We don't know if it will happen. You know, I don't think anybody knows what will happen after this Ukraine crisis is, I hope, resolved in a satisfactory manner. Yeah. But if there is a closer relationship between Russia, Pakistan, Pakistan, China, mm -hmm. I think that would pose a kind of geopolitical and a diplomatic challenge for India. Because we presume then that many of the actions that we associate with Pakistan in relation to support to terror, Mm -hmm. is something that could have problems for India. Now, as recently as two days ago, mm -hmm. we had the attack on a Shia mosque in Peshawar, where more than 40, 50 people, you know, innocents were killed. Now, that is just an illustration of what is happening west of India. The dynamic in Afghanistan, in Pakistan, and the fact that this kind of recourse to violence and terror is again slowly increasing. Mm -hmm. There is an uptick. Right. If that were to be directed against India and there is an unfavorable geopolitical, I would say, cluster forming, yes, we would have, I think, some challenges to internal security. Now, sir, coming back to this humanitarian issue, according to United Nations, uh, more than one million civilians have uh, fled uh, Ukraine due to this Russian invasion. And uh, that will create a grave humanitarian crisis. Absolutely. And India has a good record on dealing with the refugee issue. But of late, we have seen there are some security uh, concerns also. Now, we, how to balance between this humanitarian crisis, refugee issue, vis-a-vis -vis our security concerns? We have seen that in case of Rohingya uh, refugees and other refugees. What should be the ideal position or what should be India's stance? Because India has to balance between the two, humanitarian crisis that uh, that is because of the war, and uh, at the same time, we have security concerns uh, arising out of this uh, refugee crisis. Well, I would say that you're right. We should find the right balance, you know, between our security interests and what should be the, I would say, conviction or position of the world's largest democracy. Now, we are aware that India has got a track record of providing assistance whenever there has been any kind of challenge or humanitarian disaster. The example that often I cite is the tsunami of 2004, mm -hmm. December 2004. If you remember, organically, mm -hmm. India was the first country to respond to that tsunami. And the so-called Quad, as we know it now, evolved organically when the tsunami assistance started right. uh, coalescing. So you had India, United States, Japan, Australia coming together. That's one example. Sir. Now, in relation to the refugee crisis in Europe, which is going to become very acute as I see it, you know, because of Ukraine. I think the global community will again have to evolve some kind of a blueprint because the refugee crisis today, because it is Europe, because it is, because it is Ukraine, you know, there is also a certain unfortunate racist kind of element that it is being seen as a special challenge because white populations are involved. I'm sorry to say this in such a candid manner. But some of the reportage about the war in Ukraine mm -hmm. did, in a way, I think, point to this kind of an element. But there is a reality that because, for instance, say the actions of the United States, mm -hmm. we had a huge refugee crisis after the war in Iraq. We have a huge crisis in Afghanistan after the chaotic withdrawal of the United States. There are many parts of Africa where there are small and big civil wars going on, which we do not even acknowledge. It doesn't even come onto our radar unless it is a very large number of people who are killed. Mm -hmm. And because of natural calamities, climate change, there are another set of refugees globally. Now, as an analyst, I fear that the biggest refugee crisis for the world is going to be that because of climate change. Now, the last report of the IPCC is very stark. And for instance, sea rise because of global warming is going to lead to a situation where small island states like, say, the Maldives or Mauritius, 
they might be completely displaced. You know, populations would have to go elsewhere. So I think if you look at it conceptually, the refugee crisis is going to become very acute. It will manifest itself in different ways. And there is a need, I think, for the equivalent of global consensus. Now, Prime Minister Modi, whenever he has spoken about this issue, he constantly has, you know, the acronym that he has introduced called SAGAR, Security and Growth for All in the Region, which is in, the, in relation to the Indian Ocean. But I would, again, expand this further and say that today the global community is dealing with two very, very complex crisis situations. One is triggered by climate change and the other is what is happening because of COVID or the aftermath of COVID. All of this is going to impact human security. Mm -hmm. I think India should take you know, uh, ownership of this, not because we can solve the problem, but we can sensitize the global community. We know what COVID and climate change can do. We are a country that is dealing with poverty on a daily basis and we are trying to alleviate it. I think these are issues where we should come to the global table with some suggestions and ask other people to also contribute both intellectually, policy-wise, resources and deal with these issues. I mean, India should demonstrate that it can make the difference. That's my limited point. Thank you, sir. Now, sir, being an expert of internal security issues, Naxalism has been one of the biggest security, uh, security threats uh, for the last four to five decades. And we lost so many uh, military personnel, uh, security guards to this uh, threat of Naxalism or to this cause of Naxalism. But at the same time, we find commentaries that military solution is not the right solution. Then what other solutions are available? And uh, as an aspirant for this UPSC civil services, what should be my take? You know, whenever we talk about the Naxal problem, I say this with a lot of sadness also, that number one, you're absolutely right. The military option or the military approach cannot be the lasting solution to what we describe as Naxalism. Now, this is a very serious internal security issue. There is no doubt about it. Every year you find reports about whether it is Chhattisgarh or Jharkhand or other parts of India where we still have this particular challenge where people are dying. It's either the tribals who have picked up the gun or it is the security forces, police and the central police organizations, paramilitary. Now, it is very sad and I think regrettable that 75 years after independence, India has not been able to arrive at what I would call as a lasting solution to this problem. And I often quote the late George Varghese, a very eminent journalist of India, a very famous editor, where I remember in one of his lectures, he had said that actually the Indian state has abdicated because when we became independent, there was a special provision for the tribal population of India. Mm -hmm. There was a separate schedule. Right. And unfortunately, if you look at the provisions of the schedule and every state, the governor has a responsibility to review and make sure that certain policies are being implemented. Unfortunately, this has not happened. This is, the, to my mind, the reality. And I want to say this as emphatically as I can to the civil servants who are, I mean, potential or aspirant civil servants who are taking the UPSC exam, that if India is to deal with this particular challenge effectively, it is the civil servant who can make the difference, not the police official, not the paramilitary and much less the Indian military. Mm -hmm. Because I think the real challenge there is that the kind of development, the kind of empathy that is required has been denied. Yes, it is true that tribals have also picked up the gun and there is a whole sort of, I would say, political dimension where some of them may have been misled. And, you know, we now have a debate in this country about anti-nationals and things of that sort. But there is a larger undercurrent, which is that the kind of development and the kind of empathy that the tribals of India need has been denied to them. And therefore, we are dealing with this problem in a periodic basis. Right. And that's how I would frame the so answer to managing it. Right, sir. That means civil servants, they have a much larger role to play. Absolutely. Right, Absolutely. Sir. I mean, they should, first of all, I think, have the conviction that they can make the difference. Right, and there are cases. I mean, I'm very happy to report that whenever I have traveled through the interior of India, many years ago, I was studying this problem as one of India's internal security challenges, where there is an empathetic district administration, 
it makes a very big difference in small things like schools, medical facilities, you know, the girl child and providing whatever basic employment. Unfortunately, the exploitation takes place at many levels. Yeah. And we also have this whole contractor kind of syndrome where the forest wealth is being, in a way, exploited to the detriment of the tribal population. So these are the issues that I think we need to acknowledge. Thank you, sir. Now, sir, media. Media is a core pillar of a democracy. And India has a very strong history of uh, independent in media, or print uh, media or electronic media. But of late, what we have seen, this media is being conceived as biased, either for government or against the government by larger public. What do you think are the security concerns which relates to having less fake in the media and the reportage or the, the, the information that is being presented by media to us? It leads to a trust deficit because what is being reported, I don't have faith on that. So what are the issues arising out of it and how to solve this? You are absolutely right. I think, you know, the phrase that you have used, trust deficit, is very appropriate. I think it's, again, a matter of great regret that in recent years, the average Indian citizen, I would say, has lost faith in the credibility of the media. I'm saying generally, yes. you know, there are honorable exceptions. And I think this is very unfortunate and not only India I think you know if you look at it globally we talk about the syndrome of fake news mm -hmm. every major country in the world is now dealing with this phenomena and this has been aggravated by social media mm -hmm. you know the so-called Twitter Facebook and all the other platforms that we have but I think we in India need to be very very cognizant of this because of a number of developments that have happened in our own country now for instance I study this as a student of security and society and media. You know, there is an interface between these three mm -hmm. elements. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying this. I was very struck by the fact that, you know, today in the Indian languages, the term Godi media has acquired its own autonomy. Right. It's used very often. And the moment you say Godi media, people understand, you know, what the reference is. And this is pan-India, meaning every part of India has its own variant because of the local dynamic whether it is politics, whether it is because of market forces, various factors. And what has happened is that today we are in a situation where almost every narrative on any issue comes with spin, mm -hmm. you know, with a certain packaging. And that, I think, has a very detrimental effect on issues pertaining to national security. Because one of the things about national security, whether we talk about external security, say, for instance, in relation to China, what happened in Galwan, or we talk about internal security. The more you try and put spin on it, the more the problem festers. So one of the cardinal, I would say, again, tenets, which again I'm saying for the benefit of potential civil servants, is that there has to be a certain degree of professionalism, which is based on facts. Mm -hmm. Only then can you arrive at a solution. And I think the media has done a great disservice, most of the media, let me put it that way, by compromising their professional integrity because of other compulsions. You know, those compulsions can be management, they can be corporate, they can be political, they can be ideological. There are various reasons. And by the way, India is not alone. Mm -hmm. You can just look at the major democracies of the world. For instance, I'll give you one example because I'm studying that for some paper I'm writing. The war on Iraq what happened, for instance, in UK, which considers itself to be one of the oldest democracies and, you know, we in India have derived much of our legal system and various other practices and traditions from Great Britain and the experience of the colonial phase and so on. The British media, some sections, played what I would call as a very, very dubious role. And this was the Tony Blair government at that time. And they were putting spin on what was coming out in relation to Iraq to make a case for Britain to enter that war. Now, we know almost 18 years later or 15 years later when, to the credit of Britain, they had commissions that actually examined what happened and they have apportioned the blame and in pointed out that certain media houses had played a very dubious role. Now, that is the kind of, I would say, danger. If you look at and reconstruct this very objectively, 
Britain lost lives, young people who died in that war. Britain compromised its integrity as a liberal democracy. So these are the same kind of, I would say, dangers that India could also face if we make this, I would say, professional kind of, you know, you reduce your integrity, conviction and professionalism. And I make a plea that if civil servants can make the difference, they should encourage Indian media to return to what I would call as your patri. Be professional, report. You don't have to comment. Unfortunately, today I find very often, particularly in television in India, there is more commentary than reportage. Right. But this is a complex subject. Thank you, sir. So professionalism is the key. Absolutely. To bring that. To and integrity. integrity. Professional integrity. Sir, now coming back to Northeast, uh, even after we, uh, 75 years of independence, we find uh, various demands for still separate statehood and uh, separate, uh, you can say, at times, uh, secessionist tendencies as well. Now, what happened in the last 5, 10 years, 15 years, we find a kind of a chaotic scene of 60s and 80s uh, is also um, uh, resurrecting itself. So what went wrong and how to solve it if uh, I am a prospective bureaucrat? What should be my approach? Well, first of all, I would say that I think this observation is also very valid, that the Indian Northeast, I think, does not receive as much serious empathetic attention as it should. And in recent years, we can see the word that you used is again very appropriate, the resurgence, the resurrection yes. of certain movements which were separatist right. insurgencies. And, you know, if you look at the seven states in the Northeast, each of them has got their own, what I would call as uh, distinctive right. internal challenge. Mm -hmm. And that is also because if you look at the Northeast, it's a mosaic of tribes, ethnicities, languages, religions, practices, which are inherent. You know, it's the DNA of the region. Mm -hmm. And it is to be respected. It is to be, I would say, acknowledged as one of the features of the Indian Northeast, which has its own, I would say, history and diversity. Unfortunately, I think, you know, the more recent socio-political trends mm -hmm. have not been very positive. Mm -hmm. And as a result, I think, you know, the internal kind of uh, contestation, various groups based on ethnicities, based on their political affiliation, has led to what I would call as a disharmony. What should have been a harmonious kind of political, I would say, activity or engagement has now become very fragmented and very, very, I would say, bitter. And sometimes it's also not being conducted in the way. You know, we often say that in democracy you can have debate, you can have dissent, but don't sow the seeds of long-term discord. Mm. Now, that is an unfortunate trend, especially now that we also have a situation in the country where we have a national what I would call as political churn, which is that ever since the BJP has come to power, we also have an ideological, I would say, debate going on in the country. And there is this constant tension between what is seen as a majoritarian impulse or compulsion. And the BJP is associated with certain characteristics and certain an orientation. Mm -hmm. The opposition parties, whether it is the Congress, the left, the regional parties and states, etc., have a different kind of this, I think, in my view, is being played out in a rather brittle manner in the Northeast. Right. Because the Northeast has regional parties which in the past had affiliated themselves, whether to the Congress or there are even cases where the BJP has been the dominant party. But my sense, whenever I've spoken to people in the Northeast, is that what is happening is that they fear that there is an imposition of what is now often being seen as a one India, mm -hmm. a one religion a one language, a one practice, even coming down to issues of food, which is a matter of great sensitivity. So if I were, you know, really talking to a potential civil servant, I would say that you cannot impose whatever is being done in the Northeast. Actually, it's a very successful example. It's been done by persuasion. I often cite the example of Nagaland, where at one time in the 50s and 60s, we had Naga leaders who were considered to be insurgent leaders. They had gone underground. Mm -hmm. But from Pandit Nehru's time till we come to Indira Gandhi, these you know, groups were encouraged to come out. Mm -hmm. They were encouraged to participate in politics. And the same leaders become chief ministers. Mm -hmm. So that is what I would call as the you know, positive aspect of Indian democracy. 
So I think we need to actually carry the people of the Northeast in a way whereby they are not, they don't feel that they are being in a way intimidated or forced to comply. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's, I would say, part of the challenge for Indian politics. And I'm sure that our leadership is aware of it. But how it is played out will again have a bearing on national security. I mean, that is my concern. Mm -hmm. That if our politics is not cognizant of the security linkages, because of its location, because of what is happening, say, for instance, in relation to India-China, what is happening in Myanmar, you know, there are many other factors, what is happening in Bangladesh, mm -hmm. you know, meaning that it's not just India alone, it's not a domestic issue. Mm -hmm. It can have regional, I would say, influences which could be detrimental to India's national security. And there are a whole lot of things, you know, there is terrorism, there is Islamic fundamentalism, there is criminality, there is drugs, there is flesh trade, you know, there are various ways of undermining what I would call as the uh, Indian state and society. And we have to be very cognizant of that. Thank you, sir. Now, sir, when I go to uh, go for my interview, I cannot have knowledge of every aspect of internal security. So if I face contentious issues, like where I have to say yes or no, how to adopt that tact, that how to how to have that gray area, and how to handle such questions? You know, in the past, pre-COVID, I remember coming to Bajus and talking to some of the aspirants at these so-called mock interviews. And I've often said one thing whenever, you know, I've had this chance to say that if you are, you know, going to an interview, do not, you know, imagine that uh, you have to know everything about every subject in the world. It's not possible. I think if you meet an interview panel for half an hour, 40 minutes, whatever be the duration, they are trying to get a sense of you as a person. Mm -hmm. Number one, don't lie. If you don't know something, say that I don't know this and that, but you know where to get the information. I mean, today's day and age, if you have a smartphone or a computer, you know exactly where to find. Right. So I would say, number one, don't fudge, don't mm -hmm. pretend to know. But what you should, I think, exude is integrity. You should exude confidence to say that I may not know it now, but I think I know how to get the answer to this. And above all, I would say that you must be able to convey mm -hmm. to the panel that is interviewing you that I have an adequate kind of level of comprehension and empathy. Mm -hmm. And if I do become a civil servant, after all, we know that our civil servants move across the spectrum of government departments. You know, they are in the state, they are in the center, they can be in agriculture, they can be in industries, they can be in health, whatever. Right. That you have the ability mm -hmm. to deal with any kind of issue that is given to you. Mm -hmm. And that is the, I would say, sense or the confidence that you must convey. And if you say that, what is it that is going to guide you? I think this our Prime Minister has said repeatedly that as civil servants, as anybody who is in public service, we are all guided by the Constitution of India. So I think when in doubt, you know, defer to Dr. Ambedkar and what was written in the Indian Constitution and the spirit of Indian, I would say, democracy and values of that sort. I think that is what I would recommend. But remember, I never became a civil servant. <laughs> I went into the Indian Navy. <laughs> sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you so Good very time. much, sir. And hopefully this conversation, this enlightening insights shared by Commodore Uday Bhaskar, sir, will help you navigate through contentious topics. And we discussed over a range of topics and issues from the contemporary India, contemporary world, and it will help you develop your own insight. Thank you so very much.